Okay, so we have spent the last several lectures talking about stress and strain. And I think the primary thing we learned is that both stress and strain are really quantities that vary throughout the elastic body that's being loaded. And let's see here. And we know that stress is a tensor. I know that the idea of tensors can be very intimidating, but it's basically similar to a vector in the sense that it's some physical uh, quantity describing, in the case of, of stress, um, what the material is experiencing in all the possible kind of directions at a material point in, in the body. And so stress is a tensor and the components of the stress tensor. So if we write IJ, it'll look like XX, YY, ZZ, done the diagonals, those are your normal stresses. And then your shear stresses, which are symmetric. Look like this. And then we learned that for a body to be in equilibrium, the stress tensor has to satisfy a certain equilibrium condition. So for equilibrium, what we learned was that the divergence of this object plus whatever body forces we might have must vanish. And what does that mean? I think I've been, maybe I've been using this too casually, but what this means is that because we have a three by three stress tensor, because we have three cardinal directions, the divergence, this equation here is actually three equations. And those three equations look like, we're gonna first take the top row of this thing. And our divergence tells us that we should be able to take the derivative of sigma xx with respect to x plus sigma xy with respect to y plus sigma xz with respect to z. We have to add to that the force. In this case, if you notice, I picked all the ones that have x, so x, x, x. And so this would be the body force in the x direction equals zero. We can keep going. I said there's three equations. The second equation is going to involve this bottom row here. So it's going to be sigma xy divided by x plus sigma, the, sorry, partial derivative of sigma yy divided by y and yz divided by z. And because this one is all dealing with y, this is going to add the body force vector fy. And then our third equation you can probably guess what it looks like. It's going to take this last row. Oops, I got a different color here. Sigma XZ divided by X. Sigma YZ divided by Y. And Sigma ZZ divided by Z. And of course, this one adds the body force vector in Z because these are varying here. It's 
stress is a tensor. It's got components in X, Y, and Z, along with shear components in, in, their, in their X and Y, X and Z, and so on. We require this equation to be satisfied for equilibrium. And this equation is really three equations kind of tucked into one uh, that look like this down here. The next thing we learned is there are there any questions about stress equilibrium? I know I'm repeating myself, but I'm doing that for the sake of making sure that we are kind of comfortable with these ideas. For the case of strain, We know the strain is also a tensor. Its components look very much the same. And here, what we're doing is we're not requiring equilibrium. What we're doing is, is requiring some kinematic relationship between displacements and strains. So our kinematics tell us that we can write this one of two ways. We could say that epsilon ij is equal to one half ui comma j plus uj comma i or epsilon is equal to one half times the gradient of u plus the transpose of the gradient of u. Now this can be kind of confusing. And so just to be clear, u is a vector with components u, v, and w, or u1, to U3, where these correspond to displacement in the X direction, Y, and Z, and similar. Or this might be R theta phi. Etc. Displacement. I can't read that. So there are only six of these that are are independent. So we have the normal strains. And we have our shear strains. And so we can write down all of these equations. And we can say that we could unpack these like we did at the end of class last class to say that epsilon xx is the partial derivative of, the, of displacement in the x direction the 
Oops. Oops, oops, oops. Partial derivative in the y direction. Let's move these around so there's more room here. In the z direction. And for the shear strains, we have to remember that to make this notation work up here, either this, or, or I should probably pick a different color, uh, either this or this, we had to have that extra factor of a half there. And so We relate epsilon to gamma like that. And we can do this for all of them. We could say epsilon xz is equal to one half. Gamma xz is equal to dx plus d something by dz. This is by du. W. Yep. YZ, similarly, one half gamma YZ. And C would be W and Y would be V. And so here we have all of the six components of strain, the three normal strains. And the three shear strains, which we had to remember, are related to what we derived with gamma by a factor of a half. And this is where we're at. We've, we've identified there are differential relations that, that, that are acquired, required for our stress tensor to ensure that we're in equilibrium. And there are differential relations that connect displacement to strain. There's a technicality here. And this technicality is making sure that our equations satisfy, satisfy the equations of compatibility. And that really is just a way of saying, look, there are six equations here. One, two, three, four, five, six. But there's only three displacements, U, V, and W. And so you can't arbitrarily set your strains because you might pick strains that give you unphysical, unrealistic displacements. Displacements that correspond to two material points being at the same point in space. That doesn't make any sense. Displacements that open up holes randomly, close them, and so on and so forth. And so to connect, to properly connect from displacements to strains, you also need compatibility conditions. We're not going to We're not going to focus on those here. I'm putting this up there as, as something that that you should be aware on aware of and is going on behind the scenes, but it's it is it's something that we can introduce. We can only really do it nicely in 2D, and it ends up not being uh, something that comes up a lot in the types of problems that we do in this class, but there is another layer here that's going on, which is the fact that we have to ensure that our displacements are compatible. And so we're almost done. We, have, we know that force generates stress. 
And we know that if you have a body that's under stress, it's going to displace somehow. And we know that displacements are related to strains. And so obviously what we want is the ability to relate our forces to our displacements or our stresses to our strains, which leads to constitutive relations. Constitutive relations are just a fancy way of saying, how does stress relate to strain? And I should emphasize, this is up here, our linear strains. And that's important because we're going to primarily focus on, or actually entirely focus on, only uh, linear relations between stress and strain. And that means things are small. Linear relations, this is one of the weirdest things, and it's something that I still struggle with, which is, um, the true limits on when this should work are really, really small, and yet we use it all the time and it works. And it's it's kind of surprising how well linear strain, linear uh, constitutive relations like Hooke's law and linear relationships for strain, how well that they work and how far you can kind of push them before you really need to dig into the nonlinear forms. Places where you really need to dig into these the nonlinear relations are generally soft materials, biological, biological tissues, um, things like gels, jellos, soft robotic uh, structures are, are generally made of really soft materials. There's a lot that you can miss if you only use linear relations. For example, that feeling of blowing up a balloon and you're trying to blow up a balloon. And you know how when you try to blow up a balloon, it's kind of really hard at first. And then something magical happens and it just gets really easy to blow up the balloon. That is directly a consequence of a nonlinear constitutive relationship. What's happening there is you get to a point at which the thickness of the balloon gets thinner. So therefore everything gets much easier to expand. And so the whole thing expands without much force at all. You can't model that with the equations we're going to talk about here. You need the nonlinearity in the relationship between stress and strain to model something like an inflating balloon. And you might say, oh, okay, who cares if I can model how to inflate a birthday balloon? Well, balloons are, are used all the time. They're used, uh, they're used in soft robotic structures to kind of to inflate chambers to get actuation. They're used in um, aerospace uh, technologies in terms of, of uh, creating um, either like ways to measure things high up in the atmosphere, having balloons that are inflated and floating at different layers in the atmosphere to, to make measurements. They're, they're really kind of important structure, if you will, uh, that is an example of something that we, we, we need to go beyond what we're going to do in here in class today uh, to cover it. So I guess I'm bringing this up only to say what we're talking about today is kind of the first step. It's essential for modeling a lot of engineering structures. This will get you really far. This will get you to be able to measure and make predictions about most engineering materials. Most engineering materials are used in a, in a situation in which they're undergoing small strains and they behave like linearly elastic materials. Wood, uh, steel, aluminum, concrete, uh, all your traditional engineering materials are generally gonna be covered by what we're gonna talk about today. But a lot of the stuff that's, that's ongoing in the world of structural mechanics, um, especially things in, connecting structures to biological structures and things connecting structures to uh, or applying and using them with soft materials. This is, that's where you'll see this start to break down is, is when you're trying to get things that have large deformations. Before I start talking about Hooke's law, are there any questions on stress and strain 
or tensors or the relations I've shown up here. The weird thing about constitutive relations is that they're primarily empirical. Like someone basically just started hanging weights off of structures and saying like, okay, as I hang more weight on here, I get an increase in the force. And as the force, so goes the displacement. Literally, that's, that, is what, that is what the hook wrote when he published uh this as an anagram to say that force is related linearly to displacement stress is related linearly to strain they're empirical measures people are applying a force measuring a displacement and saying it looks linear you can rationalize that now by saying well all just in the same way that we're handling a lot of things by saying in 305 we kind of did a Taylor series expansion and truncated at the first term and said there's no derivatives let's just deal with like uh whatever the the force is here is going to be the force everywhere so therefore whatever the stress is here average over the area it's going to be the stress everywhere and then in this class we're saying let's do a step further let's say that our stress is going to vary some amount so if i start at a point and i move some distance I need to account for a first order change in that. And so I had, this is where all of these derivatives are popping up from, it was from the fact that we Taylor series, we Taylor expanded around a point and we looked at how things were varying as we moved away from that point. And so you can use that same rationale to, to, to rationalize why kind of materials would behave linear at small enough strains. But primarily if you're given if you're working in a company where they cook up some new material that is some uh who knows some biological material some composite material what they're going to do is they're going to say go pull on this thing in x y and z and see what happens they're gonna it's it's going to be we're going to need to determine the material properties of this thing empirically and then use these relations to, to, to connect stress and strain for it. But we need to identify what these material properties are and we do that experimentally. And what I mean is we say, we go and run experiments in which we we perhaps measure the displacement in one direction as we apply force in that direction and we find that like well hey it's 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 pretty linear and then something strange happens and we're going to concern ourselves with this linear region at first and say well we can we generally want to use materials where they behave in a way that is elastic and reversible. Elastic in that we know if we take the load off, it's going to go back to where it was. We load it again, it's going to go back to some predictable place in the future. There's not going to be a permanent deformation after we load this structure. And we know from mechanics and materials that the proportionality between stress and strain here is just some constant that we call capital E, Young's modulus. It's a proportion, a linear proportionality between stress and strain. You can do the same thing. You can measure your shear strain, gamma xy, measure your shear stress, which might be your shear force. Over your cross sectional area. And we'll get some. 
some other crazy, who knows. Relationship here, and this is going to be given a different proportionality constant, which would be capital G. And so you start writing down things and you say, well, okay, my stress in the x direction is related to E times my strain in the x direction, or my shear stress is related to another proportionality constant times my shear strain in that direction. And then you start to recognize other kind of empirical relations. These can be derived too, especially for crystalline materials or, or uh, materials of particular uh, known lattice structures. But if you don't, then you, then you, then you again, empirically observe that when you take an object and stretch it, It doesn't just stretch. There's also some degree of lateral strain in the other direction. So here there's clearly a axial strain. And there's also a transverse strain. And they're opposite of each other for most real materials. For most materials, you'll find that when you pull on something, you get a positive strain in the direction you're pulling on it, and you get a negative strain in the direction orthogonal to the direction you're pulling on it, the transverse direction. And these have relations too, in which we would say, well, there's a relationship between the strain that I'm measuring here, or if I had measured into the board, it would be the Z direction. And the force I'm applying and that relationship is given by this quantity new. And we recognize new as Poisson's ratio. Oop, not ratio, that's not a word. That's the Greek symbol nu. And so empirically or experimentally, there's generally three material properties you're measuring for linearly elastic materials that are the same in every direction. And those are E, G and new. And it, as it turns out, you only actually need to measure two of them. And hopefully I can remember this. I'm pretty sure it's that the shear modulus is your Young's modulus divided by two times one plus new. So if you know two of the three, you can calculate the third. So crash course refresher and stuff that you learned in mechanics and materials. And as for everything else in this class, 
I can say, yeah, but that's not all. Uh, and so what we're going to do is briefly talk about kind of in general, what should relate stress to strain. And by in general, I mean, assuming nothing at all. What if you just knew nothing and you were just doing math? And then we'll show how that general, the super general form that relates stress to strain can be simplified. And I'll show two generic cases. One that's familiar to you, which is generalized Hooke's law. And a second that I don't think is familiar to you, which is the Hooke's law for orthotropic materials. Okay. So if you need nothing, if you need nothing, you might recall that if you're, if you have an equation with a vector on one side, equal to something times a vector on the other side. So this is a two by two, we'll say this is like, Thinking back to like linear algebra, in order for this to be a valid equation, what you need to do is to take this thing and multiply it by a two by two object. If you had a three by three object, then on the right hand side, you would have This is this making is this like a clear represent? This is familiar, I think, for people to see this. Like if you're multiplying vectors and matrices, this is just matrix multiplication. So you can probably guess if you thought about it for a minute what we need. So now let's do this idea, but for what we have, what do we have? We have a three by three. stress tensor. Which we want to relate to a three by three strain tensor. And in order to do that, we need a rather hellish object, which is a six by six uh, proportionality tensor. We can call it whatever we want. And you could. So we're not doing I'm not we're not doing any me mechanics here. I'm just we're just doing like matrix multiplication. And we're just saying, well, if I have a three by three thing that's going to be equal somehow related to another three by three th thing, we're going to need a giant matrix that's six by six. And this giant matrix generally either takes the form of C or some fancy A, kind of depending on 
what school of stuff you're reading or learning from. Doesn't matter. You can see that up here, this is a vector. This is a vector. This is a tensor. This is a tensor. This is a tensor. What's this? Well, it's a higher order tensor. How do we figure it out? So well, let's go back to our vectors up here and see if we can say something here. We'll call this V I. It can have V1, V2, V3. This could have, uh, what's another vector letter? We'll call it B, J. This is, again, this could be B1, B2, B3. And therefore, the object that relates these two is going to have two indices, because you could have B, I, B11, B22, B33, and so on. And so this thing here would have, we'll call it like, I don't know, G, I, J. Those are subscripts, even though they don't look like it. So if you extrapolate what we're doing there to down here, we know that sigma is a tensor with I, J. On the other side of the equation, we have another tensor. We're going to give it different letters. We're going to give it the letters M and N. But the point is that there's two letters under it, right? It's a tensor. It's got 1, 1, 2, 2, 3, 3, 1, 2, 1, 3, so on and so forth. So the thing that relates stress to strain has got to be this big ginormous matrix, it's a tensor, this big ginormous tensor. And kind of learn, looking at what we did up here, just for mathematically in order to get from here or from here to here, we need this, this little friend here. Now we have two legs, two legs. And so C is actually a fourth order tensor in which it has the subscripts M, N, I, J. I don't know if this is helpful or confusing. I'm not really sure. I was, I'm trying to find a way to kind of connect ideas mathematically to you for that I kind of explain what we're going to, how we're going to uh, describe these objects. Writing things out in this way is, in, in, with all the components listed in there, it is really tough. Um, and things get kind of messy pretty quickly. Um, the nice thing is, so these, you you could each, each of these things is like a, this is C1111, and this is uh, C22, Two, two, and uh, so on and so forth. You can imagine naming these things all you want. And there are six by six. There are thirty six different um, constants. And at first glance, that sounds awful, because what does that mean? It means that it seems like for a material, if you want to know how it's going to behave, you need to measure 36 different material constants. Now, up here, I'm telling you, you need three, technically two are independent. So what is happening? Right now, we're talking in the most general form whatsoever. So for some material that is, 
uh, as generic as possible. We know nothing about it. Luckily, that's rarely ever the case. And so what happens? Well, what happens is due to symmetry, there's actually already only 21 independent material properties. Why? Well, we know that sigma like up here, look, let's look up here. We know that our strain tensor is symmetric. Sigma xy is the same as sigma, I'm sorry, epsilon xy is the same as epsilon yx. And so we write them as both epsilon xy. Even though this one should technically be epsilon yx, in order for this object not to be spinning or translating, we know that this and this are symmetric, this and this are symmetric, this and this are symmetric. Same thing over here. Our stress tensor is also symmetric. Sigma xy is, is symmetric with sigma yx, and so on and so forth. So those symmetries in stress and strain immediately, for any general material, knock us down from 36 to 21. If we add further symmetry, and we'll show this for what we call orthotropic, then this reduces again to nine independent constants. Ortho, ortho meaning orthogonal. I'll explain why we care about ortho just things that have orthogonal symmetries in a second. It might seem arbitrary, but as it turns out, it's actually really, really, uh, really, really common and useful in all aspects of, of structural mechanics. And if we have more symmetry, Symmetry is important. Remember, I was talking about Emmy Nother and her uh, discoveries about that discovery that connected symmetries to the laws of motion and uh, laws of physics. Symmetry is our friend. Symmetry is almost always what we're looking for in structural mechanics. We're looking for excuses to say that there's some symmetry. That is maybe a bit uh, getting ahead of ourselves, but as you're going to see, when we first start solving problems using these stress and strain relations, the first thing that we do is we look for problems that have symmetry because they help simplify the math. As you're seeing here, it's, it's reducing the number of constants we need. Symmetries are, are just endlessly useful. The symmetry here going from orthotropic, what's better than orthotropic? Isotropic. Isotropic means if you're standing inside the material, no matter which way you look, everything's going to behave the same. No matter if you pull on it in this direction or that direction, or this direction, the material doesn't care. So this would be isotropic. And at that point, we get down to what we want, which is E, G, and nu. And only two of these are actually needed. So you really have kind of two independent constants. So at first glance, this kind of looks like a nightmare. We have this big matrix that requires 36 things that we have to measure to put in there. Turns out because stress is symmetric, strain is symmetric, that reduces quite a lot to 21 independent material constants. And now from here, like this is where things get complicated. Like at this point here, I'm going to draw a little line here. Like here is where 
like the physics comes in. And so there are people who are studying the mechanics of biological tissues where what they're going to do is not be sure a priori what symmetries exist in this material. They have like a tissue that they're going to go and pull on and see what happens. And at that point, people in the biomechanics world are going to do what's referred to as constitutive modeling, which is to say, okay, what are the actual symmetries in this material? What are the things we need to know? What are, what are the things we need to measure? We, I've chosen two, not really arbitrarily, two of the most common ones you're going to find. The, the one that's most common is obviously isotropic. You've already seen it. And the one that's slightly uh, is, is still really common, but less so is orthotropic. But you could go from here into a bunch of different directions, depending on the material that you're measuring. There's all sorts of different um, symmetries inherent in materials um, that, that uh, would lead to different material constants needing to be measured for your, for your system. There's a particular, this is just kind of a mess to write like this, this thing here. It's just kind of a mess to write out. And so one of the things people do is they use what's referred to as a, a void representation or void notation. There's no H. And the void notation, what they do is they take your stress and strain tensor and they flatten them out to vectors. So they would, the void notation would say, I have epsilon xx, xy, xz. Wait, what happened here? Nope, sorry, sorry. I did that wrong, sorry. The void notation looks like this. It collects the normal strains and then the shear strain. So it's epsilon xx, epsilon yy, epsilon zz, gamma xy, gamma xz, gamma yz. It says, let's get rid of all those extra ones. Normally a strain tensor has got nine components. We know three of them are, the, are not independent because of symmetry. So we'll write it just as a big, long vector. Normal strains up top, shear strains on the bottom. Well, if we do that, we should probably do that for the stress tensor as well. OK, what does that mean? Well, that means we have sigma xx, sigma yy. That's not the right thing. Sigma ZZ, XY, XZ, YZ. Okay, now we're in a position to fill in this 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 block here. This first one's easy. What goes in the top box? The, the, what's the top component, top left component of this thing? Very close. I flipped the equation on you. So what does that mean? What's that? Yeah, exactly. One over E. You might recall from what we wrote up here that the strain in the y direction is negative nu 
times the stress in the x direction over e. So we have strain in y something, stress in x. So this will be negative nu over e, negative nu over e for, for this component down here. This is epsilon zz. It's going to be this times this equals, uh, sorry, this equals this times this. And then our shear strains have nothing to do with our normal strains. So these are zero. Take a second to fill out the rest of this quadrant up here. This should be review and familiar. If not off the top of your head, just by pattern recognition maybe. And we have a lot of zeros. So I filled it in if you were able to get something similar, bravo. If not, take a second to see if this makes any sense at all. I hope this is more review than not. Here's the part where you would say, wait a minute. Shear strains are related to shear stresses by G. You said I only need two material properties to fill this thing out. Well, we can remember that we have this relation up here. So you can choose to either fill this thing out with two material constants or three. But if we choose three, then we're gonna get, this is, let's see how small I can write. This is two times one plus nu over E. Oh, that's not good. Two times one plus nu over E and two times one plus nu over E. Zero, 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 zero where this, of course, is just one over G. Have I, uh, have I lost you? How are we doing? Why don't you think on that for a few minutes? Let's take a break until like uh, 10.05 and then we'll come back and flesh out generalized Hooke's law and then talk about orthotropic materials. Professor? Yes. Can you, um, would you mind zooming in again on the uh, 
bottom of the matrix. Yeah, thank you.
All right. How are we doing? Are we are we lost? Are we confused? What are we confused about? If you don't like matrix equations, might you like to see these six equations written out explicitly? So there are six equations here. One, two, three, four, five, six. Hooke's law is usually stress equals something times strain. Why are we writing this as strain equals something times stress? I don't know. I think the short answer is you often apply a force and measure a strain. And so what you want to know is what's the strain going to be if I load it with this? And so oftentimes it's, okay, I've got a bar. It's going to span this thing. There's going to be a force on it. What's the strain in this thing? Uh, so you're often interested in solving for what the displacement is going to be under some known loading. Okay, so these are six equations. What are the six equations? You can, uh, you can try to write them out yourselves if you want. They're not too bad. They should also be equations you have seen before. So the six equations are epsilon xx equals one over e times sigma xx minus nu sigma yy sigma zz. That's the first one. What is that doing? Just to remind you of your, ten, of your matrix math. This thing is equal to this times this plus this times this plus this times this, plus zero, zero, zero. And I factored out one over E and I factored out the Poisson ratio. So this equation here is this times this, plus this times this, plus this times this, plus this times this. So let's do that again. Epsilon y, y. And the last three are really easy because there's just one term for them. So or one non zero term. Now, some of you might be thinking, there's definitely a pattern here. Like, look, there's like an XX and that goes with this. And then the other stuff appears over here. And then that happens each time. I have a YY and that's here. And then the other stuff appears over here. The less obvious thing is the fact that there's a pattern down below as well. So why do we care about this pattern? Well, because we don't necessarily want to write out six equations when we can write out one equation. And you can combine all these to one equation. And this is the most common way you'll see generalized Hooke's law written. And this one equation looks like this. Epsilon ij is equal to one 
over E times sigma IJ minus nu times sigma KK, uh, what's that mean? Times Kronecker's delta. Kronecker's delta is the identity matrix, so it's ones along the diagonal, zeros everywhere else, minus sigma IJ. Oops, I'm missing a parenthesis. I should probably match those parentheses, shouldn't I? Okay, how on earth do I use this thing? Well, let's take for an example, and let's put in, let us put in epsilon 2, 2. So as an example, let's look at epsilon 2, 2. Uh, professor? Yes. For the third equation, for what's multiplying by the new, is that supposed to be still sigma xx and sigma zz? No, it's not. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. See the pattern recognition? Really helpful. Thanks for catching that. Sigma i, j, sigma 2, 2, that means what? That means sigma y, y. Now, the first part of this is easy. It means wherever you see an i, replace it with a y. Whenever you see a j, replace it with a y. That becomes sigma y, y minus nu. Now, this is the weird one. And I think I'm going to run out of room. So I'm going to rewrite this all a hair smaller just so I have enough room to fit it on one line. Sorry. It's going to be rewritten the same way. So your notes should be okay. So what do I do with this? Well, the rule is when you see two letters appearing the same time in an index or in the same time in one term when you take the product of something, then what you do is you sum over sigma 1, 1 plus sigma 2, 2 plus sigma 3, 3. So sigma xx plus sigma yy plus sigma zz. This is saying everything that is not this uh, is the identity matrix, but you should the way I think about it is this quantity is equal to, it's very simple. You think of it as, it's just one. Oops. Uh, this thing is just a very convenient way to say, give me one if i is equal to j, and zero if i is not equal to j. So i is equal to j right now. So this quantity just becomes one. So we don't need to multiply that by everything. And now we have to take this last term. This last term is a minus sigma yy. And this term and this term cancel out. And it should be fairly clear that we're left with what we had before, right? So that's how that equation can be unpacked. Let's unpack it one more, one more time. Let's unpack it for epsilon 
one, two, which is going to be epsilon x, y, which is going to be one over e times sigma x, y minus nu times what? Well, Kronecker's delta tells us that this whole term, sigma kk times delta ij, if this thing, i and j are not equal, this is zero. So this whole term goes away. And so we're left with minus sigma xj. So we can do some simplifying here and factor this out as sigma, oops, this is, uh, sorry, 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 sorry. Yeah, no, that's okay. Okay, um, this is, Sigma xy times one plus nu over e. Which is almost what we want, right? But we remember that epsilon xy is not equal to gamma xy. We're off by a factor of two here. We want to relate these. We connect it with This, I should say this a different way. This quantity is equal to one half gamma xy. Multiply through by two and you get, if you take this and multiply it over here, this thing is equal to this thing. And I'll just write, recall, Are there questions about what I'm what I just did here? This is generalized Hooke's law. It is one compact equation that represents six equations that relate stress and strain. If you don't like initial notation and you prefer operating with uh, direct notation, in direct notation we would say this one over e times sigma minus nu. Let me just make our parentheses match, sorry. Times the trace of sigma. Just to be clear, the trace of sigma is exactly the same as what this term means. Times the identity matrix. And just to be overly clear, the identity matrix means exactly what this thing means, and therefore what this thing means. Minus sigma. These are the two ways you might encounter a generalized Hooke's law. I should probably zoom back in for you. Um, questions?
just to be clear, we're over here. And this is generalized Hooke's law for isotropic homogeneous materials experiencing small strains. That sounds incredibly restrictive, kind of is. It's also really useful and surprisingly robust in terms of how often you can use this uh, to make to make uh, adequate predictions for the behavior of uh, materials and structures. Sorry about this. Thing. Questions? Nothing? Too familiar? The second most common constituent relation you'll come across are is an orthotropic material model. For an orthotropic material, in general, this doesn't mean you'll always have it be this way. In general, there are taken to be three planes of symmetry. And that basically means, so an isotropic material means like imagine immersing yourself in the material and kind of in any direction you look, you're going to see everything look the same. Therefore, when you pull on this material in any direction, the material is going to respond the same no matter which way you grab the material and pull on it. Looking up, looking down, anywhere you look is going to be the same. That's an isotropic material. An orthotropic material says if you look in three cardinal directions, they might be X, Y, and Z, or they might be uh, whatever three components that are orthogonal to each other. And this is why the stress transformation stuff is really important. If you have a material, again, let's think about uh, the most common orthotropic material is probably wood. Wood has wood grains running one direction, which is say up the axis of the tree. So what that means is if you're looking kind of down the wood grains, you're gonna see one thing, if I turn around 180, I'm going to see the same thing. And that what that means is if I were to grab that piece of wood and pull on it in the direction of the wood grains, I'll get one material response. But if I was going to pull on that material in the other direction, I'm going to get a different response because there's no wood grains there. And those wood grains affect the material response of that, of that uh, piece of wood. This is incredibly common. So wood, one of the main engineering materials that is used, like dating back to all of history and still today. Two, you know, since the 80s, one of the most common uh, new generation of engineering materials are composite materials. And typically composite materials consist of some laminated composite. What that means is, Take a fabric and stick it in some epoxy. So you might take fiberglass, woven fiber, or you have uh, woven fibers of glass or carbon fiber, 
uh, woven fibers of, of, of carbon. Those things are going to have uh, be woven in certain directions. And so if you're standing in this way and there's a weave going that direction, if you pull on that structure in that direction, it's going to have one behavior. Now, a woven material like fiberglass or a carbon fiber, it's woven in this direction. It's also kind of woven in this direction. So if I was to turn 90 degrees and pull on it, you might expect that it's going to have the same response. And it likely will. The difference would be is if I was to be in my woven material here, my, com my laminated composite, so I got fiberglass, I've got epoxy, I'm going to pull on it. If I was to now pull on that material at some off angle, like 45 degrees, somewhere in between the two weave direction, weave direction, then the material properties, if I pull in that off axis direction, are going to be different. You're not having a fiber that is giving you extra strength in that direction. And so the key takeaway here is the math is whatever the math is. It doesn't actually matter too much for us right now. The conceptual concept is pretty straightforward. I expect that if I take fiberglass, stick it in some epoxy, and I have this nice sheet of fiberglass, what I would expect and what is true is that if I were to pull it in the direction of the fibers, it's going to have one elastic modulus. If I was to pull on it in some direction, not along the fibers, it's going to have a different elastic modulus. And so instead of what we're used to, which is that there's only three material properties and only two of those are independent, E, G, and nu, now we're gonna to have to have a material property for the X axis, a material property for the Y axis, and a material property for the Z axis because pulling them in those directions is going to be different than pulling them in, uh, in some other direction. And so if pulling on something in all those directions gives you the same response, that is, if the Young's modulus in X, Y, and Z are the same, you have an isotropic material. Your life is simpler. An orthotropic material means if I pull on it in X, I, might, I will have a different response if I pull on it in Y or in Z. And so we want to have a more general Hooke's law that'll allow us to account for that. We could do all of this and we could go through. I would encourage you to read this if you're interested. It's in the textbook where they go through and they show how to reduce the, that matrix C from the 21 independent constants to the nine independent constants of an orthotropic material. Ugaral and, and, and Fenster covers that really well. For the sake of, of time and kind of a un, un need to add levels of confusion, I want you to conceptually be aware that with an orthotropic material, what we're saying is there are three symmetry axes that are orthogonal to each other, hence orthotropic. Three uh, axes that are orthogonal to each other this is where the idea of stress transformation comes back because you might not know a priori if you can't look at it. For instance, this happens a lot in biological materials where you might have some tissue network with collagen fibers running in one direction. That material is gonna behave differently if you're pulling along the axis of the collagen fibers than if you're pulling off of it. But you may not know exactly how they're aligned or if that alignment is varying through the material. And so what you might end up doing is being like, all right, well, let's take a slab of material Let's pull on it. Let's pull on it in another direction. And now let's use our ability to calculate the principal stresses, the eigenvalues, to figure out in what direction is the stress largest and smallest. That'll tell us what direction the fibers are oriented in. So what happens? Well, honestly, not that much. Not that much changes. So like, look up here. This is as simple as it gets. This is saying the strain here is equal to the modulus times the stress minus the modulus times some Poisson contraction times the stress in the other direction plus or minus the modulus times the Poisson contraction times the stress in the third direction. All that changes with an orthotropic model is you can't factor out E 
and you can't factor out new. That's it. What do I mean? So we'll go down here. Let's go to equation one. A strain in the x direction. If you can't factor out e and you can't factor out nu, what that means is your strain in the x direction is equal to one over your modulus in the x direction times your stress in the x direction minus, let's see if we can, there we go. Now look over here. We have new times sigma yy. Well, now it's not new because new would assume that all the, the Poisson ratio is the same in every direction. Now it's going to be minus new y x over e y strain in y. Now the part that this is, oops, sorry, strain in y y. Sorry, stress, oh gosh. Stress in the yy direction, the normal stress in the y direction. Now it's pretty clear why we should match uh, modulus to stre stress, modulus to stress, Poisson ratio. The key difference here is this is the strain in x. And so we're gonna have the Poisson ratio be in the y x direction. We keep going. Poisson ratio in the Z X direction over the modulus in Z times the stress in Z. Again, same thing. X So it's actually not that much worse. We just have additional material constants that we need to measure. We can keep going. And you could probably guess these. Oops. One uh, new XY over EX times the stress in the X minus one over modules in the Y direction. And we have three more equations. They're also pretty straightforward. Gamma xy now equals sigma xy over your shear modulus in that xy direction. Gamma xz shear in z. And so the key takeaway here is there are extra material constants. Now we have a little bit of fortune, which is that these things are not totally unrelated. So there is still more symmetry, our friend's symmetry, which tells us that 
new x y over e x to equal new y x over e y new y z over e y should equal new z y over e z and new x z over should in a different way to match new zx over ez should equal new xz over ex. So that simplifies things a little bit. So what that means is, as we said at the outset, there are now one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine independent independent material properties. And what that means for you is that if you got a piece of fiberglass and you want to use it and you need to figure out what's going to happen, you can't just spit out some elastic modulus. It doesn't mean anything. You need to be able to say, what's the modulus in the direction of the fibers and what's the modulus in the other directions? What's the Poisson ratio in the direction of the fibers? What's the Poisson ratio in the other direction? What's the shear modulus and so on and so forth. So what that means is if you're dealing with a more complex material, wood, fiberglass, carbon fiber, uh, biological tissues uh, that have collagen networks in there. Um, trying to think of. Yeah, those are probably the most common. I might be blanking on one, but I think those are the most common things that will involve orthotropic materials. These can take on different, different things like something like plywood is also has some uh, some symmetry axes now plywood is laminate laminates right so there's no fibers running in one direction but you still have have uh symmetry in the fact that if you pull on plywood in the direction of the plywood it's got those laminates so it's going to behave the same way but flexing it is not going to is going to uh depend on uh the, what's happening through the z direction so you can imagine how complicated these things can get. And a lot of people spend a lot of their time dealing with constitutive modeling. Like for instance, turns out it's really uh, a nice way to strengthen certain materials is to add uh, either nanoparticles or oftentimes carbon nanotubes to this matrix. And so what that might mean is you have some composite, some like uh, medium that you're gonna add some percentage of carbon nanotubes into it. And those things are gonna be little rods that are sort of like fibers, but they're kind of short and maybe they're randomly oriented. Well, now how do you predict how that thing is gonna behave? You need more complex constitutive models to say, okay, most of my carbon fibers are oriented in this way, if I lay it up this way, so I can get them to kind of behave like a, a composite that's an orthotropic material, or maybe not. What I'm getting at is, as we engineer more and more complex materials and structures, these constitutive relationships can get complicated, but what the end result is often Okay, we need to measure more material properties. We need to measure material properties in the direction in which these materials have anisotropy. Anisotropy meaning something that's not the same in every direction. It's like the most general form. It's like the polar opposite to isotropy. If everything's the same, it's isotropic. If it's everything's completely disordered, it's anisotropic. And then you have start to build in symmetry back in there. Orthotropic. There's other types of symmetries that can that can help uh, simplify the problem for you. But the idea is stress is related to strain. If everything is all equal and square, then there's just three material properties. Only two of them are independent. And then as things get slightly more complicated, what you see is the appearance of you need more material properties. 
And that's all this is saying. These stress and strain relations are the same as the ones we wrote before. If we were to, if I was to tell you, hey, what happens if EX and EY is the same? Then you can simplify this. What happens if I tell you that EX, EY, and EZ are the same? You should be able to show that this gets us back up to the top equation. Um, yeah, questions? Um, this why is the wiser? Oh, it's not. Thank you. Yeah. Just bad habit and going fast. All right. That is positive. Thank you. So we understand, if we zoom out for a second, we now have a complete picture and we can start solving problems using methods of equilibrium. We understand stress is a tensor. It must satisfy this equation to be in equilibrium. This equation is actually three equations and they're here. We understand that strain is a tensor. It must have, satisfy some kinematic relations that connect us between displacements and strain. And those connections between displacements and strain are given compactly here, or I guess obtusely down here. And now we understand that there are constitutive relationships that relate stress to strain. Here's strain is equal to some stuff times stress. Those stuff are your material properties. In the simplest case, you have an isotropic material. You only need a couple. In the next simplest case, you have an orthotropic material. You need some more. And now we can start solving problems. We have stress, we have strain, and we have a way to relate stress and strain to them. What we'll do next is rely on our, our friend symmetry to pick some problems that are um, fairly straightforward to solve. I would ask you to come next week with a Mathematica and your laptop because it's going to make our lives a lot easier um, for solving some of these equations. Um, and it also makes it really nice to visualize and plot some of these solutions. And uh, yeah, with that, have a nice weekend. I tried, I was up late grading. I, I didn't finish, but I'm, I'm gonna try to finish today. Um, so I'll, I'll get those to you. Uh, I'm working, uh, I'm still, I'm grading. And I'm also trying to get caught up in my backlog of putting videos on YouTube. Um, so I should hopefully resolve some of those soon as well. Thanks for your patience, everyone. Have a nice weekend.